Game of Thrones has finally ended. The drama of who would be the ruler of Westeros has been settled, and it's not really someone anyone would have predicted. Not the heir to the Iron Throne, or the mother of dragons, Daenerys Targaryen, or the other heir to the Iron Throne, Jon, quote unquote, Aegon Targaryen Snow. In the end, one Targaryen killed another as seems to be tradition, and the great lords of Westeros chose a new ruler. This time though, not someone of Lyrian blood or a conqueror who bought the throne with blood, but instead, Brandon Stark was named king of the Six Kingdoms, maybe seven at this point, on the recommendation of Tyrion Lannister during the Great Council. So against all odds, the boy that dreamed he would be a knight instead became king. But when Bran was crowned king, who actually won the Game of Thrones? The wrinkle here is that Bran is not himself anymore. He has become what he routinely calls the Three-Eyed Raven, the memory of the world and avatar of the old gods made flesh. A sorcerer king of old in the tradition of figures like the Grey King, the Night King, the War King, Garth Greenhand, and many, many more throughout the fictional history. His cryptic and often confusing statements about the nature of who or what he is raises a lot of doubt on who's actually sitting on the throne of Westeros at the end of the series, or more precisely, who is in control of that body and what they really want. A little bit of a rewind, after traveling to meet the previous Three-Eyed Raven, Brynden Rivers, Bran Stark traveled through the world of dreams and time ways themselves, seeing the world in a way that no one living does. As I described in my video, does Bran have a plan? And as it turns out, he did, and it was Tyrion Lannister like I thought. Bran's powers are closer to a modern mass surveillance and access to the entire history of the world. Almost as a flex in the finale, Bran said he would use his powers to try and find where Drogon met, meaning that he may be seeing more than ever before, perhaps even into Essos or the Doom of Old Valyria. Bran is the ultimate master of whispers, better than Varys or even Bloodraven in his day. But it's, it's more than that though. Bran's story is very much a take on the Celtic and Arthurian legends of the Fisher King. This magical figure is a king that has taken some kind of leg or lower body injury that prevents him from walking, yet possesses intense magical abilities and sometimes objects. In the Celtic legends, the Fisher King, sometimes called Bran the Blessed, who has a magic cauldron that allows undeath, and he himself persists beyond his own fatal wounds as a talking head that uses his magic to protect England from foreign invaders buried in London. In Arthurian myths, this cauldron is sometimes changed into the Holy Grail. What both of them have in common though is the idea that the Fisher King cannot really rule or act effectively on his own. His personal injuries and delving into magic as well as prophecy makes him a poor leader that his subjects suffer under. The name Fisher King actually comes from what he does all day. All he can do is sit in a boat and fish while waiting for heroes to come along to help him, which is honestly very similar to how Bran acted in this past season, seemingly doing nothing while the people around him did all the heavy lifting of the battle and saving the realms of men. But behind it all, it was Bran pulling strings and pushing things in particular ways. It's very important to understand Bran's role as winning the throne of Westeros as a take on these ancient stories and how his stories matches, but also how it's a very different twist on it. Very often the health of the land itself and the people are tied to the Fisher King's health, that as his wounds grow worse, by extension so does nature. Something you sometimes see in Lord of the Rings where the land is corrupted wherever Sauron or Morgoth goes, and that the Fisher King uses brave heroes, often King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table, to answer questions or complete some quest that ends up healing him and restores his ability to do more than just fish. These ideas tie in well for Bran's role as the speaker for the Weirwoods and the Old Gods, ostensibly the natural world itself, much in the same way the Fisher King is connected to them. As the humans took over more of Westeros, the natural world suffered. The children of the forest were penned back, and in the current times we know that many species like direwolves, aurochs, giants, and many more have become functionally extinct in the realms of men, but still exist beyond the wall where the old gods still hold sway with their fisher king. A lot of this is tied to the end of the reign of the children of the forest over Westeros, who had a much more balanced shamanistic view of the natural world. Those enshrined in the weirwood throne
villains like Bloodraven and Bran, who have both been maimed in their lives in different ways, fit this idea rather well, with many of the heroes that we know from the story acting as the Knights of the Round Table. Bran and Bloodraven wait for the heroes to cure them of their curse, in this case mostly the White Walkers, that keeps them trapped in their cave and fishing rather than ruling. Because they could be. The power that the Three-Eyed Raven figure has through the Weirwoods cannot be overstated. They can see and hear almost anything. That kind of knowledge kept someone like Ares II on a throne when it should have toppled long ago. In the hands of a competent, intelligent ruler, there's no telling what the power of the Weirwoods could give them. Now with that framework in mind, let's move back towards what Bran's crowning really means and what he represents. In the long past, the children of the forest and their sacred trees held sway over all of Westeros. They worshipped their old gods and lived among the trees until the first men came with their fire and metal swords to take away those forests. The thing about the Weirwoods though is that they see time and a cause and effect very differently than men. As Bloodraven once told Bran, Time is different for a tree than a man. Sun and soil and water. These are things a Weirwood understands, not days and years and centuries. For men, time is a river. We are trapped in its flow, hurtling from past to present, always in the same direction. The lives of trees are different. They root and grow and die in one place. The river does not move them. The oak is the acorn. The acorn is the oak. And the weirwood, a thousand human years, are a moment to a weirwood. And through such gates, you and I, make gaze into the past. They take the long view, seeing not in individual years or even human lifetimes, but in massive hundreds and thousands of years timescales. Thus, the strategies they enact are built around this, focusing on patience and waiting for opportunities that mortals cannot. The children of the forest even seem to know that their time in this world is at an end, leading up to the end of Game of Thrones in A Song of Ice and Fire. Where are the rest of you? Bran asked Leaf once. Gone down into the earth, she answered, into the stones, into the trees. Before the first men came, all this land that you call Westeros was home to us. Yet even in those days, we were few. The gods gave us long lives, but not great numbers, lest we overrun the world as deer would overrun a wood when there are no wolves to hunt them. That was in the dawn of days when our sun was rising. Now it sinks, and this is our long dwindling. The giants are almost gone as well. They who were our bane and our brothers. The great lions of the western hills have been slain. The unicorns are all but gone. The mammoths down to a few hundred. The direwolves will outlast us all, but their time will come as well. In the world that men have made, there's no room for them or us. They are sad and morose that their time is ending, but they already know their place in this large grand plan of theirs, and for them death is not the end. The key piece though that they are apparently waiting for was Bran Stark. When you look at the history of Westeros and beyond, it's really a long story of the Weirwoods and Old Gods losing battles, but then somehow winning wars in the long term. I talked about this in my How Strong video, how the strong seemingly never die because of their strategy of, of planting their quote unquote seeds or children everywhere. They wait out their enemies and just outproduce them. Much in the same way, when the first men arrived in Westeros, they came with their axes and fires and pushed the children back into the deep woods, cutting down the old gods as they went. But then something odd happened. Rather than treating these grim trees as their enemies as they had in the past, the first men began worshipping them. So much so that first men culture is now impossible to separate from weirwood worship, which is strange considering they used to be mortal enemies. And again, when the Andals arrived, much the same thing happened. They started cutting down the first men and the children with their weapons and fire and cut down the sacred trees, but in the end, they allowed the trees to stay after the conflicts ended. They didn't continue chopping them down. Some, even like the Aarons of the Vale, tried adopting weirwood worship. They attempted growing a weirwood in the Eyrie, which failed, but even still, they have their weirwood throne and moon door made from weirwoods. The Ironborn as well, with their love of the Drown God, have 
the many stories about the role of Weirwoods and Weirwoods staffs, and their most famous son, the, the infamous Heron the Black, built his castle on the shores of the God's Eye, which is one of the holiest places in Westeros for the old gods with the Isle of Faces. Inside the castle he built is the largest God's Wood that anyone's ever seen. So even the Valyrians and their dragons seem to be a massive threat coming from the east with their fire and blood. For tree worshippers, that would seem pretty terrible. However, again, over time the Targaryens began mixing with the First Men, and you end up with Brendan Rivers, one of the most powerful magical characters in the world, eventually known as the Last Greenseer or the Three-Eyed Raven. The Weirwoods and the Old Gods over time somehow absorb their enemies and turn these conflicts into their favor. Across the world, many civilizations rose and fell and their gods ended up destroyed with them. But not these gods, not the old gods of the woods. No matter who threatens them, somehow they eventually assimilate and continue to thrive. They turn the strengths of their enemies into their own strength. And that's where I believe Bran Stark comes in. Multiple times this season and last, other characters asked him what happened to him and who he was anymore. They noticed the oddness to his behavior and the way he spoke. But Bran, every time, responded with a cryptic answer that he's not really Bran not anymore. What he is, is this quote-unquote three-eyed raven. There's been speculation from the fandom and Isaac Hampstead Wright himself on what that phrase means exactly. On one hand, it could mean that because of the huge amounts of knowledge that Bran has access to, there's very little space left in his head for himself. He's replaced his personality with the knowledge of the trees and taken up this mantle of the three-eyed raven. Where previously his head was mostly Bran Stark, the percentages may have changed to the point where most of his memories are not his own anymore. It could also mean that he is in some form of shock or maybe information overload. If he truly has seen the total history of Westeros, we as viewers know what a horrible and violent place it can be. Bran was honestly devastated when he found out that his father did not defeat Arthur Dane, that Howen Reed did it for him despite the stories. And when Bran finally saw Sansa again, he commented on how beautiful she looked on her wedding night to the villainous Ramsay Bolton, inferring that he he knows what happened to her afterwards. All these moments of awfulness may have built up in him, and he's sort of become numb to all he sees, his ability to feel perhaps mostly gone. And as a defense mechanism, maybe he's clinging to this new identity. However, the most fantastical possibility, and the one I favor, is that some or most of his body has been taken over by what the Three-Eyed Raven is actually is. It sounds a little crazy, I know, but not only is this a fantasy series, you have to think about what Bran has done throughout his life. His ability to warg in skin chain is essentially his mind dominating that of another and taking their body for his own. Normally this is reserved for animals, as the simplicity of the mind seems to be a factor in letting skin changers take control of their bodies, maybe something akin to the weak-minded ideas from Star Wars with the Force. Yet Bran has gone far beyond that with his ability and he began and taking Hodor's body at will, opening the possibility that a human mind could be seized as well. So when Bran says he's not really himself anymore, that could be literally true, that he may not be in full control of his body anymore. A door that has been opened can be walked through both ways. Maybe something more powerful in the Weirwood net has done to him what he did to Hodor. What I think the Three-Eyed Raven actually is though, is sort of the collective soul of the Weirwoods and all those who dwell in it. In Westeros, there's such thing as a second life, where upon their death, skin changers like Bran can claim a new body, usually an animal, and live on in it. However, there's a cost, and one that Bran has been warned about with his warging of Summer and Hodor. If you stay too long in somebody else's body, you eventually start losing yourself, Jojim told him. Spending too much time in summer skin is dangerous. You're not a dire wolf, Bran. No, it's tempting. If you're trapped in summer for too long, you'll forget what it was to be human. More interesting, though, is the warning from Bloodraven. In this scene, he goes further than just animals and tells Bran this. You finally show me something I care about, and then you drag me away. It is beautiful beneath the sea. But if you stay too long, you'll drown. I wasn't drowning. I was home. What he's implying in this quote is that if you stay too long in the past, in the trees, the same thing can happen. Your sense of self can be eroded until you quote unquote drown or 
lose yourself, much like Jojen said to Bran about Summer. And then after the escape from the cave and the White Walkers while traveling to Winterfell, it seems like Bran may have drowned doing exactly that. He has learned to access the trees in the past remotely, whereas previously he needed to touch the weirwoods and the roots to do that, and it appears that he spent almost all that time delving the past, slowly drowning. And as he lost himself, perhaps the godhood of the Weirwoods, the collective consciousness of untold generations of Greenseers, has been slowly taking over Bran Stark's body as his mind drifts between the trees. The singers of the forest had no books, no ink, no parchment, no written language. Instead, they had the trees, and the Weirwoods, above all. When they died, they went into the wood, into leaf and limb and root, and the trees remembered. All their songs and spells, their histories and prayers, everything they knew about this world. Maesters will tell you the Weirwoods are sacred to the old gods. The singers believe they are the old gods. When singers die, they become a part of that godhood. In effect, Bran Stark on the throne may be a fulfillment of everything that the old gods have wanted since the first days the first men crossed the Arm of Dorne. If they have Bran's body, and it seems like they may, it's part of this consistent strategy I mentioned earlier of losing battles but winning wars in the long term. They could not defeat men and their brutality. They even tried turning them against each other with the creation of the White Walkers. Those violent humans they couldn't beat empowered fully to do whatever was necessary to end their own kind. Unfortunately, it seems like that one kind of backfired and became trapped by their own creations as the Night King and his followers stalked outside of the trees, and the Night King sought to end all life, in particular the Three-Eyed Raven, and the memories of the world that he holds. Through Bran, though, the trees appear to have escaped their icy prison. But even more than that, more than escape, they found in Bran real power over humans in the form of their strange custom of kings. All Bran did in the last season was to preserve the Three-Eyed Raven in the trees trees it comes from. He sacrificed friends and the lives of many around him so that he would live. In particular, Isaac Hempstead Wright says that his urging of Theon to attack the Night King was only to buy time for Arya to actually kill the Night King. And now as king, Bran can do presumably much the same, but on a much more massive scale. The absolute political powers of a king can be an enormous force for change, and in this case, we have more than a king. We have a sorcerer king, one who can't be surprised, who can see anywhere and everywhere, who has the ability to seemingly rewind the lives of anyone, like a videotape, and mine their lives for their secrets. One who thinks in the extreme long term and plans on a level no one else can keep up with. Of course, there's one major downside in this victory for the old gods over the White Walkers, the Valyrians, and the first men in the Andals, and it's that the seizure of power is short-lived, just one human life. That's the claim made during the show anyway, that as a cripple and in the idea of the Fisher King archetype, Bran is a powerful magical figure but cannot reproduce. His new dynasty will end with him. At least, that's what everyone thinks. But we as the viewers should know better. We saw from Bloodraven and Bran that two apprentices can be found and trained, new bodies acquired for the trees to act and speak through. Perhaps if and when Bran's life ends, he can have another green seer ready to go as the successor. More than that though, the weirwoods and magic in this world have been found to extend lives long beyond their mortal limits. The world of Game of Thrones is honestly littered with examples of people using magical means of extending their lives. Bloodraven himself was ancient, pushing 125 years or so when Bran finds him in that cave. Most had written him off as dead when he deserted the Night's Watch, but he lived on in his weirwood throne, the roots growing through him and preserving his life. In addition, we have the Undying of Karth. Although in the show we don't actually see them, we only really see the odd blue-lipped warlocks who act for them. The actual Undying are ancient magical people who preserve their lives, if you can even call it that, across thousands of years. Through the indigo murk, she can make out the wizened features of the undying one to her right. An old, old man, wrinkled and hairless. His flesh was a ripe eyelid blue, his lips and nails bluer still. So dark, they were almost black. Even the whites of his eyes were blue. They stared unseeing at the ancient woman on the opposite side of the table, whose gown of pale silk 
had rotted on her body. The story of the Grey King is also one of a mythical sorcerer king who, you guessed it, lived so long that eventually his skin turned grey, and he could not die until he walked into the sea of his own choice and joined the Drown God in his watery halls. The Night King as well is a proof of this concept. He lived in his own way, if you can call it that, for thousands of years since his creation. So there's very good reason to think that the same could be true for Bran, that he could find a way of extending the life of this body far beyond what anybody thinks is possible. Especially with his knowledge of the world, he may be able to delve the secrets of how others did it, and maybe even improve on the process. What we are seeing is the beginning of a dynasty of not House Stark, but instead the dynasty of the Weirwoods of the Old Gods. They waited out all their enemies and rivals, and as the forces of ice and fire lay dead in the dirt, their own avatar was crowned king of the humans against all odds. A crown that they may never give up again as they wrap their white roots around the throne and through King's Landing, and the branches and red leaves rise above the Red Keep. The secrets of the old gods, said Jojen Reed. Food and fire and rest had helped restore him after the ordeals of their journey, but he seems sadder now, sullen, with a weary haunted look about the eyes. Truths the first man knew, forgotten now in Winterfell, but not in the wet wild. We live closer to the green in our bogs and crannogs, and we remember earth and water, soil and stone, oaks and elms and willows. They were here before us all, and will still remain when we are gone. The trees in the old gods seemingly did just that, and outlasted everyone else to take back their home from those pesky humans with their axes and fire. The remaining question though is, if this is a good thing, does that make Bran and the Weirwoods evil for their role in the history of Westeros? I tend to think that really depends on what you think they'll do with that power. With his near omnipotence, Bran is in position to be the most well-informed and intelligent ruler the world has ever seen. Yet we've seen example after example of how idealistic people are warped and corrupted by the power they wield, from the mythical to the very, very real. With Bran's crowning, we may have seen the dawn of a great empire, or the last days before the long night of a god on earth ruling forever. We can only hope that somewhere in his vast knowledge, somewhere in Bran's head, he can maybe still hear Eddard Stark telling him how to rule. The blood of the Fushmen still flows in the veins of the Starks, and we hold to the belief that the man who passes the sentence should swing the sword. If you would take a man's life, you owe it to him to look him in the eyes and hear his final words. If you cannot bear to do that, then perhaps the man does not deserve to die. One day, Bran, you will be Rob's Bannerman, holding a keep of your own for your brother and your king, and justice will fall to you. When that day comes, you must take no pleasure in the task, but neither must you look away. 